Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and a very cordial welcome to this opening session of our Social Development Impact Summit. It is devoted to the theme, The Great Reset. And you have seen in the short movie, the wealth and the breadth of issues which will be discussed in a very impact-oriented manner uh, during this meeting. I want to thank the co-chairs and the panelists of this opening session for being with us. And I want to thank particularly President Juke for your presence today, because uh, there is a long friendship with uh, your country and the World Economic Forum, but also you are serving as a role model for being really a forward-looking leader. It's a very large audience participating in this meeting. We have over 3,000 participants from over 130 countries. And of course, to do justice to the complexities of issues we will have over 60 different sessions. I want to thank the uh, organizing committee in the World Economic Forum, uh, particularly Terry Toyota, uh, for her engagement and for her strong work. We um, will have exciting uh, moments over the next days. I'm looking very much forward to those, and I wish you a very good meeting. But before we start the meeting, I just want to recall the five pillars which we want to address. First, shared prosperity. Second, catalyzing cooperation. Cooperation is so important, particularly public-private cooperation today to address all the issues which we face. Better business. What can we do in order to implement the stakeholder concept? For harnessing technology, we have all the new technologies of the fourth industrial revolution. How can we use them best in terms of providing a human-centered approach? Uh, to uh, technological development, and finally, maybe most urgent at the moment, livable planet. So again, thank you, and I have now the great honor uh, to um, introduce uh, the remarks of His Majesty King Abdullah of Jordan. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Your Excellencies, dear friends, I am delighted to help launch this much needed discussion at such a crucial time. And I thank my dear friend, Professor Schwab, for his dedication to bringing about positive change in our world. Indeed, real sustainable development that is truly felt by all peoples has perhaps never been more needed than it is today. To help us overcome the COVID 19 crisis, and its humanitarian and economic ramifications, which will continue well beyond this pandemic. Striking all countries at an unprecedented universal scale, this crisis should also be seen as an opportunity for all of us if we act decisively and act together. We must begin by rethinking our entire global system to become more integrated, resilient, and just. A globalized world cannot thrive by leaving its most vulnerable communities behind. We are all in this together, and the sooner we realize it, the better. Rebuilding our international system towards a more inclusive economic recovery starts from the ground up through mutually beneficial bilateral, trilateral, and regional partnerships that form a global safety net to alleviate poverty and unemployment, bolster food security, and safeguard our environment. We in Jordan have been working with our partners in the region and beyond to invest in the strengths and resources of each one of us and build complementarities 
for the shared prosperity of our world and the well-being of our peoples. The COVID-19 crisis has led Jordan to invest in its agricultural, ICT, medical, and pharmaceutical capabilities in partnership with the private sector to help ourselves and others. And we are ready to build on this potential to become a launch pad and a regional hub that facilitates international and regional efforts to respond to the challenges ahead. My friends, this pandemic and its long-term consequences have exasperated the long-standing crisis in our world. The climate crisis, poverty, hunger, unemployment, and social economic inequalities have worsened after years of ineffective collective action. The way forward must be rooted in a re-globalization that fortifies the building blocks of our international community by enabling our countries to strike a balance between self-reliance and positive interdependence, enabling us all to jointly mount a holistic response to all crises facing our world. A response that strengthens our global economy, but also addresses inequalities. A response that leads to technological and industrial progress, but also ensures the sustainability of our shared environment. So in your discussions today and in the days ahead, instead of looking at problems to solve, I urge you to look at opportunities to seize and ways to collaborate to rebuild a truly global inclusive system that leaves no one behind. I wish you a fruitful summit. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Karen Cho, anchor for Squawk Box Europe from CNBC. Let me first start off by thanking His Majesty the King of Jordan and Professor Schwab for their opening remarks that formally kick off this first session of the Sustainable Development Impact Summit. Well, life has certainly changed from the, the series of global meetings many of us would normally attend to these virtual summits. And this one obviously being a key one as we stay, stay, in, uh, stay on track for key agendas. Now, there is a silver lining to this virtual world we're living in, just one out there. And that is that instead of hundreds of people attending this summit, we now have thousands. So we welcome all of you today and appreciate the time you're dedicating to this session. Well, we've caused this moment the Great Reset. Let me give you some context for the discussion we'll be having for the next 50 odd minutes or so. The COVID-19 pandemic has wrecked havoc on societies and economies that dealt a major setback in achieving the 2030 Agenda and the Paris Climate Agreement. Under the theme of realizing a great reset for sustainable development, the agenda is framed around five thematic pillars. Professor Schwab just mentioned them, but let me highlight them again. Shared prosperity, catalyzing cooperation, better business, harnessing technology, livable planet. The summit co-chairs and SDG champions will be sharing their own inspiring stories, commitments, struggles, as they address these five pillars. The objective is for all of us to challenge ourselves to ask the question, what more can I do? What have I not thought about? As we try and seek momentum in that countdown to 2030, we'll be asking the panelists to react to each other's comments, uh, for our speakers to react to questions from the audience, and to try and implement some of the initiatives today elsewhere in society. We're aiming to keep this conversation as dynamic as possible. So I'll urge again all of our panelists to get involved in this conversation as we try and challenge the narrative and contribute to as many points raised. This is not a passive audience as well. We urge you to send questions on Slido. That is the platform we're using today. It is slido.com if you've not used it. And just a reminder, you can enter the event code hashtag S-D-I-S. -S. So where possible, we will take questions throughout this session, but we will be particularly dedicating a, a comment session towards the end of this forum. But let's begin as I introduce you to our panelists. Ivan Durkee, who is the president of Colombia, elected in 2018, Durkee become Colombia's youngest president. He has many strings to his bow as a politician, lawyer, and author. As a senator, he played an instrumental role in key legislation to develop the creative industries and culture, unemployment law and rules to extend maternity leave to 18 weeks. Anushka Retnayaka, who is founder and CEO of Myagro and young global leader. Anushka's mission is to move small farmers out of poverty 
and has spent more than a decade working in rural Africa, helping to increase food security and market access for small scale farms. Her current goal is to increase the incomes of 1 million smallholder farms by $1.50 a day by 2025. Grace Forrest, founding director, Walk Free. Grace has spent extensive time in Southeast Asia and the Middle East using photography and storytelling to convey the plight of survivors of modern slavery and regularly represents Walk Free at international events at the UN and Vatican. She's the UN Association of Australia's youngest ever Goodwill Ambassador for Anti-Slavery. Elaine Bijoni, who is CEO of Majid al Fatem. He was appointed CEO of the sprawling Emirati hoarding company in 2015, which includes shopping malls, retail and leisure establishments in the Middle East and North Africa, with operations in 13 countries. Elaine is credited with transforming the group's operating model, giving it purpose and vision. And our final panelist today, Rebecca Masayek, who is CEO of TechSoup Global. Rebecca joined TechSoup in 2001 and set about launching a program to donate technology products and social enterprise. It now serves an NGO audience in 236 countries and territories. TechSoup has connected change makers around the world to more than $13.5 billion worth of technology products and capacity building services. So as you can see, very wide experience and certainly touching on all of these five pillars that we are speaking to today. Well, let me first come to President Durke. Well, you are the co-chair for Catalyzing Cooperation Pillar. So let me ask you, as this pandemic has dealt a major setback to achieving the 2030 agenda, global cooperation was already under threat before this crisis, and in many ways it's worsened in the months still. What do you think are the biggest challenges to achieve effective global cooperation on the sustainable development agenda as we battle a major health and economic crisis? Well, thank you so much, Karen, for your question. It's a great honor to be here in this panel. I also want to express the, the honor that it is for me to share with this distinguished group. And I also express my gratitude to Professor Schwab for the invitation. I also express my gratitude to King Abdullah to join us this morning. And essentially, I think uh, the challenges that we have before us are, are very clear. On the one hand, I think this uh, pandemic has showed that all of us have to embrace this cause, not only to reduce our individual footprint in terms of CO2, but I think we all should be aware on how to mitigate the challenges that evolve from climate change. So I would say first challenge is that we need to keep on accelerating the energy transition around the world. Energy transition is going to be pivotal. And um, when we look at the case of Colombia, we only contribute with 0.4% of the CO2 emissions, but we want to embrace this cause as if we were the number one emitter. And that means that we are going to expand by more than 10 times the installed capacity of non-conventional renewable energies in Colombia. And we're leading the energy transition in Latin America so that we can have 70% of the regional matrix with uh, renewable energies. That's one. Second challenge, I think it's the fight against deforestation. Deforestation has a tremendous impact worldwide and in Latin America, we should do something even stronger. We have been able in the case of Colombia to reduce by 90% the, the deforestation rate in the last two years, but we have to make the Leticia Pact, which is the pact to protect the Amazon that was signed by eight presidents of the Amazonic Basin in Latin America so that we, can ensure that we will have clear objectives, not only to reduce the reforestation rate, but also to reforest and protect the areas. Primarily because a country like Colombia has 35% of its soil in the Amazonic basin. When we look at the amount of hectares and square kilometers that we have in Latin America, we're talking about more than 5 million square kilometers. So it is a very important cause. The third element is clear tra clean transportation. We, we believe the world need to move moves faster by having more electric vehicles in the road. We want to make that also consistent with the development of non-conventional renewables. We issued, uh, in the case of Colombia, the uh, clean transportation bill. And we hope that we can expand by five times the car park in the next 10 years. So it's gonna have a tremendous contribution. I should highlight the circular economy policy which I think it's a way in which corporations can actively participate. And that means 
produce conserving as and conserve con producing as a mantra. And it is important that we develop what I consider is the ethics of the 21st century so that citizens around the world are conscious about the three R's, reduce, reduce, recycle, and so that we can reduce the individual footprint. And last but not least, there's something that we want to, to lead and that's why we're working hand in hand with the web. And it's the concept of biodiverse cities, how cities can actively contribute to the protection of biodiversity around the world. So on that, hand, on, on, that, on that scope, on the one hand, we want to develop the One Trillion Trees Initiative that was launched last year by Web. In the case of Colombia, we want to contribute with 180 million trees that are going to be planted from now to August 2022. We are reaching the objective of maybe 50 million trees planted by the end of this year, which has also happened in the midst of this pandemic, but also we need uh, the cities to contribute in waste to energy programs and reforestation. And we also want cities to be conscient about the protection of the paramos or what we call the high altitude ecosystems. Colombia hosts 50% of the world paramos. It is a source of clean water. And we want the whole world to participate not only putting resources, but finding nature-based solutions with communities. So I consider those are very important challenges, are challenges that we must all embrace. And I'm very happy that with the web and being now in, in our case, the co-chairs of the Sustainable Development um, Board, we really want cities and countries to embrace these elements. If we embrace these elements, I think we're gonna have a strong contribution, not only to protect the environment, but to have a clear result in the upcoming years when it comes to reduce the CO2 emissions and the individual footprint. President, thank you very much for the comments. Uh, Anushka, I may come to you next as uh, the co-chair of the Livable Planet Pillar. And effectively, MyAgro helps small-scale farmers access finance. Farmers who play uh, a major role in food security in Africa, but among the poorest in society. You've used mobile banking to improve financing and shared knowledge in agriculture techniques to increase yields by 50%, which is just extraordinary. Perhaps you can share an ex example with us about how you brought about that change. Sure, thank you. And thank you everyone for uh, you know, having me here today. It's really an honor to, to share what we do at MyAgro. Um, and I, I truly agree, Karen, farmers are at the heart of having a livable planet. They grow the food that we eat, usually for razor thin margins, and most smallholder farmers globally live in poverty. And we all know it's not a secret that farmers need tools to adapt to outdated agricultural practices given climate change. And until now, most of that change has been pushed by the consumer. But to truly reset, this change needs to come and start from the farmers. And, and we can help support them to do that by, by deeply listening. And, and that's how I got the idea for MyAgro over 10 years ago. I was working in a microfinance organization in rural Kenya, and I was trying to collect repayment, uh, which is really hard because farmers don't have a monthly salary. And in that process of listening to farmers and going to visit them every day, I started to hear this pattern where farmers would say things like, you know, I really like this loan, but can I over repay my loan for next year's loan? Or they would say things like, oh, I really like your organization. Can I have a loan for a cow? What I really need to improve my harvest are, is, is our assets like cows, but I'll pay you for two years before getting the loan. So it's interesting, they were using the language of credit, but what they were actually describing if we truly listened to them was a savings product. Farmers knew that they had money throughout the year. It might be in small increments, as small as a few dollars, but they needed a reliable place where they could lay away that money little by little to make large investments in their farms that could be catalytic, that could change the trajectory for their family. And so that's what MyAgro did at a time where uh, the only solution farmers were, people were thinking about in the uh, development community was how do we extend credit to farmers? We actually created a new system of what we call it digital mobile layaway where farmers can pay on their own for the seeds and fertilizer they need to invest sustainably in their farms so that they can grow enough food for their communities. And so I think, I think that's the key to this great reset that Professor Schwab talked about. How do we listen to the people closest to the problem and through partnership with them, with private sector, with government, create solutions that can truly reset to help us reach the SDGs. 
And Nishka, just quickly, if I can follow up, how are the farmers that you work with being impacted by COVID-19? And is there a support role for, for more of us to consider? Yeah, I think absolutely they're impacted, particularly in uh, countries where we work, where governments uh, created uh, restrictions on travel or closed weekly markets, which is the main way that farmers earn money during the dry season. Um, so there was a lot of hesitance uh, to spend money and to make investments in their farm. And so I think uh, in the next coming uh, six to 12 months, food security is going to be our biggest crisis, even maybe even ahead of COVID. And so I think governments and organizations that support smallholder farmers really need to come together in partnership to think how to do things differently to support farmers, to help increase their risk tolerance, to create a cushion for them, to ensure that they can still make investments that will feed them and our communities. Anushka, thank you. Uh, Grace, let's come to you and your work with the Walk Free Initiative. I, I want to just get to some of the, the changes you've already brought about. You, you've managed to change legislation. You've encouraged the church and religious leaders to throw their weight behind your drive to end modern slavery. I want to talk a little bit about your work and perhaps why the pandemic has also increased the challenges that you see out there. Thank you so much, Karen. I think I'd like to first start um, by establishing the problem because so few people understand the scale of slavery that exists with us today in the 21st century. So we know that one out of every 200 people on earth are currently living in modern slavery. That's more than any other time in human history and actually double the number of those living in slavery in the time of the transatlantic slave trade. The interconnectivity of that trade and slavery now is still there, however, through racism and inequality, which still sets a roadblock for so many people to reach sustainable development throughout the world. Slavery is a term which encompasses a number of highly exploitative practices, but today I'm gonna to focus on two, forced labor and forced marriage. And I think the opportunity to build back better, to have the great reset, it speaks specifically to business because supply chains have been built in a normalized way on the exploitation of many, many people. And yes, the pandemic has absolutely exacerbated that crisis. I think um, nowhere is this more apparent than the treatment of migrant workers. There are entire systems built to keep people in slavery and to keep people exploited, such as the Kabbalah system. And equally, what we've seen as the result of COVID-19 is millions of workers trapped overseas not captured in national health plans, not paid for their work, al allowing many more millions of families back home to go without food. This is a problem that happens all over the world and many people think of the global south when this comes to mind. However, in the UK just a few months ago, there was a major fast fashion company found paying workers half the minimum wage, being forced to work through lockdown with no PPE. This normalised exploitation needs to change it is not acceptable that any of us should be able to buy anything that harmed another human being in the process. Yet it is the norm in the clothes we wear, the food we eat, and the technology in which we speak today. Grace, I'll just pick up on that point. As you single out a fast fashion business here in the UK that canceled some of its orders, clearly a number of businesses are in a very similar situation. They need to manage the demand side, they need to manage supply because demand has fallen so aggressively in this crisis. What do you recommend? What do you encourage them to do in terms of stepping up to ensure they have a role in society to support those workers and suppliers for the future? The way supply chains are currently built is that when a crisis hits, the one right now is COVID-19, but another one will hit again in the future, whether it's a natural disaster or another pandemic. The first people who are hit are the people at the front, those who are vulnerable those who are already usually not paid a living wage, as Anushka spoke to, already living in poverty to grow the food we eat, to make the clothes that we wear. And in a situation of crisis, instead of those at the top, protected by huge corporations and very large paychecks, taking the brunt of that hit, it is those on the front line who take it first. And that is simply unacceptable. But it's not only unacceptable from a human rights perspective, from an economic one, it is completely unsustainable. As we saw supply chains come to a grinding halt in the peak of this crisis, the mad rush to acquire PPE globally, it's not a mistake that we can't acquire things in a rush that aren't made fairly. It's not a mistake that much of the PPE that was acquired globally will end up in the ocean. 
The system has been built that way. The system has been built for convenience over anything else. And it's time that we create a human centric one, of course, because it's the right thing to do, but also because it's the smart thing to do. And this comes down to basic accountability and transparency across national and international supply chains. Lisa, thank you very much for that. Uh, Elaine, I want to come to you as I introduced you earlier and mentioned that you were instrumental in rethinking your entire organization, how it operates, but you've also been very vocal on how the Middle East catches up on climate change. Now, as we talk about this great reset for many businesses, the theme of the summit too, uh, realizing a great reset for sustainable development, how should businesses be run at this stage to, to maximize this great reset? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Karen, and, and thank you for having me. Uh, you know, the, the words that I just heard from, uh, from uh, Anushka and Grace are, are quite inspiring, and it actually reminds me of the work that we do day in, day out with the farmers in Kenya or the impact that our business has, uh, has across, across the region and our industries throughout the world. The reality is we can't run business as usual, what used to be called business as usual. Today, uh, we've seen this through COVID, and we're going to see it even more afterwards. Uh, to what Grace, is, Grace, is, Grace said, uh, su supply chains were built to be efficient, uh, irrespective of the cost that they have locally. And uh, I'll give you an example. One of our businesses is grocery retail, our Parfour business in, in the region. And one of the big things that we pride ourselves to do is the fact that we partner with local farmers. I see that Anushka is smiling. We, 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 uh, we uh, partner with local farmers in, in, in most of the countries that we operate in in order to localize our supply chain. And really our, our aim there is to do two things. One is locally sourced, but also allow people to reinvest in their business, to stay in their lands, in their villages, and be able to actually have clarity on, on their cash flows coming forward. What people want is not difficult, is not impossible, is not absurd. What they want is logic is basic, basic equitable economic relations where actually businesses pay on time and actually give them a fair, a fair return for the investment that they are doing. This is something that is extremely important for us, but this is really a base of what we do across uh, the supply chains that we have across all of our businesses. Uh, businesses have today a very important role in, in changing the, the world to a better place. And I think the great reset that Professor Schwab has spoken about is a fantastic opportunity that you have to rebuild it in an equitable, inclusive, and sustainable manner. Uh, Majid al Futaim has, for example, one of the things that we, the first thing that we did was actually to commit for a net positive strategy on water and carbon by 2040, but also to make sure that we are ESG rated and that we actually pave the way for green financing and also make sure that we are contributing to the sustainability of the environments uh, uh, and the communities that you operate in, going, implementing, and say, walking the talk on stakeholder capitalism. This is something that is not anymore an option. This is something that's actually necessary. And in this context, I think the work that the IBC is doing on DSG, whether it's adopting a framework that, that, is simply, that is relatively simplified that people can understand or the metrics is extremely important. Disclosure by corporates and by businesses is very important because this is how we can all get to two things. One, an equal playing field to, so people really can invest their money in green projects where actually it matters to them how do they make their profits. But also you have the ability to make sure that you are driving the business and you are doing, doing well by doing right. And this is something that is extremely important for businesses today. It's not an option anymore. I think COVID has been, yes, as you said, when you started, it, it really has, uh, has disrupted and threat havoc in, in everything that's happening around us. But it also opened our eyes on the fragility of the world that you operate in. We've been talking for quite some time, how can we harness technology? How can we get the planet to a more uh, uh, livable state. I still remember one of the World Economic Forum's themes uh, a few years back, which is responsive and responsible leadership. We've seen that the lack of all of that got us to a situation, okay, that we would have never thought possible. And our ability to work together, take this, turn this into an opportunity, uh, going back to what His Majesty King Abdullah said, how can we actually grab this opportunity to make something out of it and to build a better world. 
is, is, is something that for me should be top priority for all corporates, uh, whether it's in the region here in the Middle East, but globally as well. I want to dig a little bit deeper in a moment, but uh, first up, let me come to Rebecca, because you've been working for close to 20 years on ensuring vulnerable parts of society are not left behind by the technology revolution. Now, in this crisis, this current crisis, certainly fears have escalated about societal divisions widening because of <coughs> lack of access to technology. How would you describe the challenge right now versus what you've witnessed over the past couple of decades? Well, thank you very much to uh, Professor Schwab and the World Economic Forum, uh, as well as His Majesty the King of Jordan and all of the distinguished panelists and, and guests who have tuned in for this. This is quite an opportunity to bring a civil society perspective to these important discussions, and I'm excited about that. Uh, to, to realize a great reset, we must be willing to include and engage grassroots civil society in shaping and driving the collective action needed toward the global goals Simply giving them a voice isn't enough. They must be an equal stakeholder to business and governments, an equal stakeholder in the stakeholder capitalism vision. Grassroots civil society is large and diverse. In many countries, it represents two to 5% of GDP and globally is made up of an estimated 12 million organizations contributing nearly $4 trillion to the global economy. This sector knows so much about what is and is not effective in development. They see it and they live it every day. Their relationships and methodologies offer significant contributions alongside public-private partnerships. There are 250 million people working in this sector uh, to bring, and they bring unique capabilities. They're deeply connected to the very values and the ideals embodied in the Great Reset and the Global Goals. We have an opportunity to make the assets of grassroots civil society more visible and more connected to important fora like this. Bill Gates has talked about the wide availability of digital technology that allows sharing of information and global collaboration as being a critical factor in the speed of innovation. But digital technologies simply are not yet widely available to civil society at the grassroots level. We must invest in the necessary infrastructure for innovation. We need to support civil society workers and their communities in making all they know available to each other, to governments, to business, so that the Great Reset is in fact a reset and is in fact improving both justice and opportunity for all. TechSoup itself was founded as a grassroots organization, a nonprofit, with a $2,500 grant and a mission to bring tech mentors to other grassroots organizations. Through robust partnerships with more than 100 technology companies, the use of technology as an enabler, and the establishment of a global network of more than 60 independent NGOs, TechSoup has scaled as a values-based marketplace to deliver more than $14 billion in technology and capacity building resources to over a million civil society organizations. This past year during, alone during the pandemic, we distributed $1.5 billion in resources as tens of thousands of organizations moved to remote work where that was possible. In a single month, 41,000 nonprofit learners enrolled in our online remote working and security course, for example. We've all seen this year just how interconnected and fragile our complex systems are. It is my fervent hope that we will create a great reset that will strive to overcome systemic injustice. An inclusive approach to the Great Reset and to sustainable development will reach significantly better collective outcomes in the future, and it will enable innovation in places and from people with ideas that have not been expressed anywhere else. Thank you. Rebecca, thank you very much for the comments. Now, Elaine, I did promise to come back to you and I want to pick up on this moment because I was looking at all the initiatives you've been involved in trying to encourage some of your customers to, to cut back on the water consumption to, to save water. And there was an education campaign that you ran that clearly fewer people are coming into some of the, the retail areas, so it's hard to communicate that program. Also, in terms of rewarding green shoppers initiatives that you worked with some of the retailers on. But as life changes, and even for your own business that was doing particularly well, it's been hit by this crisis. How do you stay on track and how do you manage to reinvent your way out of this pandemic? So I would say two things. One is uh, there's always an opportunity in every, in every situation. I think COVID also presents a lot of opportunity. We've never been as connected with our customers digitally. And I think this is something that we have been able to really uh, capitalize on. Uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, we've done two things 
the campaigns that you mentioned, but also a pledge to actually ban, totally ban plastic by 2025 in all of our, of our operation across our 17 markets. Now, of course, this year was a great, in a way, because of the lack of business, a great way to reduce plastic. But the point is, how do we keep that going? And that also gave us a, a big opportunity to rethink uh, packaging, to rethink how do we actually interact with our customers and make sure that we provide more sustainability, sustainable, sorry, ways of servicing our customers. I have to say that our customers in general are much more aware of the importance of it. And there has been kind of a fast tracking of the awareness and understanding uh, that we are capitalizing on. That also includes, for example, how can we, uh, how can we reduce the, the carbon footprint by, by developing more and more uh, 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 vertical farming in our stores in order not to transport, in order to minimize all the, all the, the supply chain uh, and all the uh, emissions that come from transportation, packaging, et cetera, et cetera. So this, uh, the, the pandemic has, has accelerated this need of a more anchored life, more uh, or of lives anchored around neighborhoods because it's safer, because people acknowledge and recognize what's happening there and they feel that they are in a more, uh, in a safer environment. And we have responded to that with, through technology in order to do, uh, to do better business, but also to serve our customers better. So all of these initiatives, given the diversity of our our businesses, we feel that you're in a privileged position to be able to tackle them from different aspects and different standpoints. And this is something that's extremely important. You mentioned the green rate, uh, the green star rating uh, initiatives that we have with our tenants across all of our shopping centers, where we have around uh, more than 3,000 of them, uh, where we actually support them in managing their resource, in managing down resources, waste, etc., in order to make sure that we live up to our commitment that all of our assets, our shopping centers, hotels, et cetera, offices, are all environmental friendly building and they have a LEED or a BREAM certification. But that's not something we can do alone. It's something we have to do in partnership with our tenants. So the way they deal with their own business has an impact on that outcome. So we've put in, in place frameworks and, and uh, metrics to support them, incentivize them, because it's a win-win situation at the end of the day. I just remind our panelists too, you, you can jump in and get involved if there's something you would like to respond to. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll come back to President Duque. I want to ask you a very similar question, but at a government level around Colombia, because your country's fortunes have changed along with many others during the coronavirus crisis. Once one of the fastest growing nations in Latin America beforehand, now expected to contract around 6% so far this year. At the same time, you have a migrant crisis on your doorstep. Five million Venezuelans have left their country in the past five years. So I'm wondering, President, where this leaves the green agenda. Is there a role for government to continue to step up the, the fight towards some of these targets as businesses themselves are challenged to trying to achieve the same level of commitment? So Karen, I, I like um, your question a lot because uh, in fact, yes, we started the year when we look at the growth in January and February, we were growing above uh, 4%. And then we had to um, struggle with the, with the pandemic. And we decided to make the decision to protect lives, to protect the, the health system, to reduce the exponential level of growth of, of, uh, of the pandemic and for us to adjust. And I would say that in this uh, last five months, we have been able, uh, first of all, to expand our ICU capacity, duplicating it. We started with 5,300 ICU cap capacity or units, and now we have more than 10,000. On the other hand, when we look about deaths per million, contagions per million, we have also, I think, behaved uh, better in comparison to other places in the world with higher income per capita. But at the same time, we started a process so that we can regain productive life since April. And when we made the last decision in early September of, of uh, a new model of social distancing, we basically had 90% of the economy running. Now we need to reactivate and we need to do it responsibly. But what is important about your question is that we have not let the green agenda behind. We obviously know that we are struggling with uh, with, with a migration crisis in Latin America, and primarily because we have 1.8 million Venezuelan brothers and sisters that have fled the country because of the effects of the dictatorship. 
And we have been able to try to, to manage that, that presence in Colombia with fraternity, but obviously the situation is unsustainable and primarily because we know this dictatorship is linked with crimes against humanity as was denounced last week by the UN. Now on the green agenda, we have not left it behind. We have even accelerated more. When, so when we, when we think about the concept of the great reset, we are even accelerating more the energy transition. And in the recovery plan that we announced in July, when I had the, the, the State of the Union equivalent address, what I said is we're going to make the biggest expansion of renewable energies by 2022. And that means we're going to pass from having 0.1% of the energy matrix in non-conventional renewables to get to 10% by the end of my term. But we also launched the program of biodiverse cities so that we get the cities more involved in the protection of biodiversity. And we consider this uh, as another engine of the recovery. We made a clear statement that on, on the One Trillion Trees Initiative that was launched last year by Professor Schwab, and we said Colombia wants to be there with 118 million trees. We're gonna reach 50 million by the end of the year, but we contribute that with nature-based solutions and the payment for environmental services for peace, and we're gonna get them involved and they're going to participate actively in their recovery. The same thing is happening with clean transportation and something that is very important, Karen, and I think that's, that it also is connected with the wonderful things that I've heard from the panelists and is we need to think about how we can connect protecting the environment with this social agenda. And when we think about reducing the individual footprint, I think we're seeing now that a virtual education having less business travel, but being more efficient in the way we produce results. And at the same time, looking at, at technology solutions that can reduce the amount of cash in the streets, they all have a positive impact in, in the environmental footprint. So I think the concept of the Great Reset is it's a message that we all get so that we can balance our attitudes and policies so that we keep on thinking on growing, but growing in a sustainable way, in a cleaner way, and obviously in a more humane way. I, I, I was listening carefully to all the messages that we heard and thinking about B corporations, thinking about eradicating um, slavery or, or forms of slavery around the world. And at the same time, connecting businesses to be more responsible in the way they, they have their products and the way they approach the client so that the client can be militants on the sustainable agenda, I think are the, the processes that we want to accelerate in Colombia. So in a Thanks. nutshell, yes, the challenge is big, but we are not leaving none of the green agenda behind. President, thank you. And that uh, naturally leads us over to, to Greece. I want to come to you on, actually, someone I met on the sidelines of WEF at the World Economic Forum earlier this year, who tweets me virtually every day about slavery and supply chains, modern supply chains run by many famous corporates. You ask the question, how is this still happening in this day and age with all the, the power of social media? How can this still be happening behind the scenes? What do you want to see happen this year and in coming years so that we actually genuinely have change? Well, that, they were just such wonderful points made by the president just now because the interconnectivity of social well-being and environmental safety, they, they truly go hand in hand. And um, I think in this great reset, we need to be very honest about the fact that we cannot keep moving forward while so many people are essentially held back. Um, and the thing is, when it comes to business, that the reality is that slavery is a normalised part of the supply chain, convenience at any cost. And the truth is, the cost often comes at someone's most basic freedom or even life. Um, last year in July, we actually estimated that in order to reach the SDGs goal for 2030 to end slavery, we would have to free 10,000 people a day from now until then in order to reach that goal as well as dismantling all the core drivers. And these numbers I can say quite scarily are conservative because this is pre-COVID-19 exacerbation. But what I can also tell you is that for the first time since Walk Free was established 10 years ago, I can see an opportunity to move on the scale that is necessary to reach that change. And the point that was made earlier about legislation, it, it's so critical. And there are such huge gaps in this area 
You know, the quickest way any of us give up our power is not realising how much of it we have. And in a legal sense, there are only two nations in the world that have a modern slavery act which is legislation that requires businesses of a certain size to disclose on issues of slavery within their supply chains. What it has caused within those two countries alone, only the UK and Australia, is greater public awareness of this issue, greater boardroom care about this problem, and hopefully a higher level of transparency over time. We need all the world's most powerful nations to have a modern slavery act to account for exploitation at home, as well as in their far reaching global supply chains. Transparency is not everything, but it is the bedrock on which real change can be built. It is the bedrock on which accountability must be made. And the second point I'd make around legislation is that slavery is without a doubt a highly gendered problem. 71% of all victims of modern slavery are women and girls. And one such area which disproportionately affects women and girls and is, in our opinion, a major roadblock to the SDGs is the enablement and continuation of forced and child marriage. Only 51 countries around the world have criminalized forced marriage, leaving 133 falling short. And unless our nations have specific legislation addressing these issues, people will continue to fall between the cracks. Grace, thank you. Uh, next up, I'm gonna take a slider question and Rebecca, if I can come to you on this one. Uh, thank you to Phyllis who has written through saying, what are the main methods the WEF and panelists are using to advocate the five pillars to the common person and how can we help? An interesting question, Rebecca, as we ask that question, how can we help? When I look at your model, you've clearly had a lot of businesses investing, giving grants and loans and that helps, but, but what can the average person do or is the only help really gonna come from Silicon Valley, big tech and business? Well, I think that we've heard a lot today about local and the need to do things locally. So I, I think that anyone could have uh, something that they can contribute locally. And that, that might be because they're uh, working with a, an organized part of civil society, or it could be, uh, you know, they could be a board member, they could be um, volunteering for, for activities, or they could obviously be contributing funding. Um, but also there may be just uh, groups that are more informally organized or mutual aid societies and things like this. I think that this is a time when a lot of people would like to do more even people who you know done a lot in the past uh, and and I think you know when you put a technology lens on it as, as our work does I think that there are a lot of people who uh, know quite a bit about technology that they use in their everyday work perhaps and uh, they may have those kind of um, skills to bring not so much even just the skills of deep technology uh, there are lots lots of uses of emerging technologies and the the uh, more advanced technologies but there are a number of organizations who simply don't have the most basic tools or the most basic training they're not secure in their environments and there are a lot of things like that that uh, people could help with Anushka, let me pitch the same question to you. Uh, you've spoken to us how you're addressing the livable planet pillar, but what can our panelists, what can our audience and more widely governments and business do to help you? Well, I think as, as citizens, uh, one of our most fundamental duties is to vote. Um, and so uh, vote for uh, governments that you support, uh, policies that you support that are going to support the Great Reset support us uh, creating policies and environment, uh, legislation like Grace mentioned that are going to help us actually reach the SDGs. And uh, I think that's a way that we can all contribute. I've got another question here. I'm gonna pitch this one at Elaine. Uh, it, uh, the question says, how can governments and businesses collaborate to enable a human centric system that protects labor and the environment whilst creating shareholder value? Well, I think it is it is very simple uh, to do that because it's just common sense. I think governments are more and more aware of the importance of doing that, and they're more and more aware of the importance of working with the private sector. I think the major roadblock that existed before is the the lack of I would say uh, uh, the lack of harmony between private sector, public sector, and the ability to work together. We talk a lot about PPPs and we talk a lot about frameworks of cooperation between public and private sector when it gets to projects. Well, these are more important infrastructure, social infrastructure and backbone, backbone projects that businesses and governments can do together. It is in everyone's best interest to make sure that we actually have the proper, the proper social infrastructure that we need in order to tackle the world in the right way going forward. Governments are more aware about that 
businesses uh, businesses are also more aware about that. It takes few businesses to lead by example, and also it takes uh, it takes the ability to put in, pl in place the right incentives to push people in the right direction. Everyone has seen the fragility of the system that we are living in. I think it's a great opportunity for this great reset uh, in the in uh, in the right place and the economic integration that is needed across all the regions, but particularly in this part of the world, uh, is extremely important and across industries. So I think we, we currently have the, a great backdrop to be able to leapfrog when it gets to social infrastructure, better business, and to uh, create a more inclusive uh, and sustainable world. President, to the next question on Slido, I think perfect for you, given the work that you're doing to, to fight uh, some of the, the change we're seeing in the Amazon and the, the comments that you made on biodiverse cities. The question is, those who are already vulnerable are in the front lines on this climate crisis. How can we adapt and safeguard our communities for this new scenario? Well, I, I consider that there are many important challenges regarding crimes against the environment that I think we should all highlight. Sometimes we talk about drugs and we always talk about the debate whether there's legalization or prohibition. But let me go even a, a deeper a, into the debate. It's not just about legalization or about prohibition. The world has some sort of a, of a world consensus against drugs, but let's go to the environmental damage. When we think about, for example, cocaine, cocaine destroys tropical jungle. For every hectare of coca that is planted, three hectares of tropical jungle are destroyed. The usage of chemicals for the development of those drugs are really generating a massive damage. And part of the deforestation that we see in, in Latin America, and especially in the, in the tropical jungle is because of this business. So I think we should all be acknowledgeable enough that we have to do something against this type of illegal business, not only because it's bad for health and it's bad for security, but it's because it destroys the environment. And the same thing happens with the legal production of uh, the legal development of cattle and the illegal development of, of the wood industry. So when we raise the Leticia Pact and we get the compromise of eight heads of state from the Amazonic region, it's because we have to reforest and we have to find nature-based solutions so that we don't have more illegal cattle production or illegal wood production. And this can be a major change if we embrace uh, nature-based solu solutions and we get the peace and sending, we get the indigenous communities to participate get a sustainable income, and at the same time, embrace the ethics of the 21st century, where we all have to produce conserving, conserve producing, and protect these very important regions around the world. I think we have raised that before, before the, the eyes of the presidents. We have a big commitments and objectives, but the other thing that is needed is that we can mobilize world resources, not only to protect the Amazon basin, but to protect the world paramos. And it is a way where companies can even have credits uh, so that in the, in, in, in the same manner that they have developed the carbon credits, they can buy the credits to protect these very important regions around the world. And that can help us mobilize more resources. That's why this week we'll be launching the World Paramos Initiative so that we can get funding for corporations to protect green water sources and very important high altitude ecosystems around the world. I think if we connect the private sector, the provision of resources, the access to carbon credits, but at the same time, we involve the indigenous and, and Aboriginal communities protecting these spots in the world, I think we will do it much better. President, thank you. We are running out of time. We've only got a couple of minutes left, but I want to get some takeaway messages. Uh, Anushka, if I can come to you first to react to uh, some of the comments that you've heard today, some takeaway messages that you think are particularly relevant for your particular situation. Feel free to weigh in uh, for uh, about a minute or so on what you think you, you've gleaned from this session. Well, I think it's been really inspiring to hear from my fellow panelists. And I think the uh, comment that everyone had in common was that in order to have this really 
amazing, great reset, this opportunity that we have in the face of COVID, that we need to focus and include the people who are the most vulnerable um, and that they really need to be at the heart of any solution that we're putting forward. And, and that really excites me. That's the heart of, at the heart of what we do. And, um, and I think will lead to truly sustainable change. Rebecca, a takeaway message from you is something that you've gleaned from this session, but also something that you may want to leave the audience to think about. Well, I really heard human centric, local, uh, frontline, cities, neighborhoods, inclusivity. And so I think that this is really at the heart, as was stated by Anusha, of what, what Anushka, what is needed here uh, for the reset. But I also want to say that harnessing technology is one of the keys to doing that. Involving civil society, making them stronger uh, is, a, is also one of the ways to do it. So I just hope that we won't waste this opportunity because the, it's been a very difficult time for so many. Uh, and I think that this is just a giant opportunity for us to be better as we go forward. And Grace, can we hear from you? Um, Rebecca, I couldn't agree more with what you just said. Um, this is an opportunity and if the Great Reset can be anything to us, it is that it's a pause in our current trajectory and history will remember how we use that opportunity. History will record whether or not we chose to continue despite all the facts of what we knew to fix it. And, um, and also I want to champion what Anushka said about voting. It is such a privilege to vote and every single one of us needs to do it like our lives depend on it. And I don't just mean voting for political leaders. I also mean voting with your dollars. Vote for businesses that align with your values because money talks and every single person can do that as a consumer. Lastly, I think the message I'd leave everyone with is that business can and should become accountable for every person within their supply chain, protecting the people at the front and not just the people at the top. And equally, that all legal roadblocks to women and girls to fully participate must now be removed. It is the only way that we will reach the SDGs by 2030. Elaine, we've got about 30 seconds, over to you. I would build on everything that was said, just add timely. I think it is absolutely the time is absolutely opportune and this, this great reset is really in our hand. It's about what we do. I agree with Grace. It's about it's about actually voting, voting not just I mean in, in, in the uh, on the election day, but voting with your action and voting with your money as well and making sure that you, you walk the talk and you put your money where your mouth is. It is a fantastic opportunity uh, that you have ahead of us and it's all in our hands. President, finally, something that captured your attention and a message you'd like to leave with our panelists and audience today. That it has been a great honor for me to, to see this, this great panel. And I think if I may summarize it in, in a way, I think the great reset leaves us with the, with the message that we have to find more humane solution. We, we've talked about technology, we've talked about business sector, we've talked about fighting slavery, we've talked about sustainability, but I think it, at the end, it all summarizes that the, neck, the great reset is how do we have an approach that is more humane and that individually speaking and in the ethics that everyone has to embrace in the 21st century, we have to acknowledge that whether it's technology, whether it is uh, with entrepreneurship, whether it is with, uh, through governments, we all have to put the, the human being at the center. And that means the human, the human being has to be more conscient about how to reduce the individual environmental or CO2 footprint. And at the same time, how that they can all participate in building everlasting sustainable solutions for nature and for society. President Duque, Anushka, Grace, Elaine and Rebecca, thank you all for your contribution today and to our audience for joining us. Just a quick note, uh, you can react and uh, also make some more comments on all the social media channels. Also, uh, this broadcast is available on TopLink. But uh, a big thank you to the World Economic Forum for coordinating this summit today and also to Professor Schwab for his leadership on many of these important issues. Thank you so much for joining us.